Bullseye with Jesse Thorne is a production of MaximumFun.org and is distributed by NPR. I'm Jesse Thorne. It's Bullseye. If you know the work of Kulap Vilaisak already, odds are it's because she made you laugh. Maybe it was on the podcast Who Charted, which she co-hosted for eight years on the Earwolf Network. She also created the TV show Bajillion Dollar Properties, which ran on CISO. She's also an actor who's appeared in dozens of TV shows, like Parks and Recreation in The Office. But for pretty much as long as she has been a working actor, comedian, writer, and showrunner, she's also been working on a completely different project, a documentary called Origin Story. that's streaming now on Amazon. And its title is its subject, Kulop's Origin Story. It's a story about family secrets, learning to adapt to them, to empathize with difficult parents, and to connect with brand new loved ones. Kulop was raised in Minnesota. Her parents were both refugees from the secret war in Laos. One night, during a family argument, her mother told her something that would change her life completely. The man who'd raised her isn't her birth father. In Origin Story, Kulop confronts her history head on. She reckons with her parents, her mom in particular. She talks about identity and her experience as a second generation immigrant. She finds her birth father and goes to Laos to meet him. Here's a bit from the documentary. In this clip, which opens the film, Kulop takes us through the night she found out. Her face changes. She's scared. I run to the living room to talk to dad. I tell him what she said, expecting him to say it's not true. His face changes. He is scared. I don't know what to do, so I run. I run down the townhome stairs, over the piles of shoes. Barefoot, I keep running until I stop by the pond. I have nowhere to go. Up. Welcome to Bullseye. Hi, thank you for having me. You've been working on this movie for a long time, Kulap. Congratulations on. Thank you. Thank you so much. Five years now? About, if not a little more, and possibly a little less. <laughs> but at a certain point, who's counting? I mean, the thing that is stunning to me is I, I remember when you were first going back to Laos, which was the first time you had gone to Laos. Oh, it was the third time. The third time? But first time without my mom, the person who makes everything easier because of language and and culture. Um, This was a brand new experience. And I remember you being terrified about it. Yeah. But you've like, not only did you do that, you've also lived with that for the five years since because you have been making this movie this whole time. Yeah, and like versions of it, so many versions of it because of the editing process. And then with 70 plus hours of footage, sifting through both that and my feelings about said footage uh, has been um, an extraordinary experience. Let's talk a little bit about your personal history. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Egan, Minnesota which is a suburb of St. Paul. What's it like there? It is, um, surprise, surprise, predominantly white. Um, It was a great place to grow up, Uh, great public schooling. Um, Growing up in in the Twin Cities overall, uh, I think there is a, there's Minnesota nice. Um, there's also Minnesota. Don't talk about anything. Um, there's I think also that's a part of Minnesota. Nice, right? Yeah, I guess you're right. Uh, the apologizing if I um, remotely touch into your personal space, but but yeah, I've always kind of felt a little bit outside of any group. Um, not American enough, or not Asian enough, and also not Lao enough. Who did you grow up with? I grew up with um, my mom, uh, Boa Pet, aka Pat Vilaisak, and uh, someone who, uh, and my my dad, who I learned later on was uh, my stepdad in Peng Vilaisak, 
and uh, two of my sisters, uh, who are nine and 11 years younger than me, Anita and Alyssa. You also grew up partly with family members who were Norwegian, Minnesotan, <laughs> sponsor family. Yes, yes, the what Danielsons. Does that, what does that mean? They were both, I also want to add they were also Swedish. Oh, okay, excellent. <laughs> Scandinavian. Yeah. Um, when my mom came to D.C., uh, her uncle had already been set up with a sponsor family in Anoka, Minnesota, another suburb, this one, um, the Minneapolis side. And uh, her and my birth father were having some trouble in D.C., and my her uncle was like, asked the Danielsons to bring us to live with them. Uh, and so they were a big part of helping my parents integrate and sort of transition from Laos into America. We stayed in their home. Uh, Aunt Julie watched me as my parents went to school. And, you know, throughout my life, they've kind of been a surrogate family. We heard a little bit of it in the clip. When and how did you find out that the man that you knew as your father was not your biological father? I was 14. Uh, my parents have a really difficult relationship. Uh, they have since divorced. They would have just really scream fest, basically. And uh, this night, I don't know what they were fighting about. I was sort of hiding out in uh, their room because that's where our uh, computer, our family computer was. And my mom retreated and was complaining about my dad. My dad, whom I sort of I get along better with. I think I look like him. I think I take after him. And while she was complaining about him, I defended him. And she said, why are you defending him? He's not your real dad. And I kind of looked at her because, like, my mom, she weaponizes words a lot. So this could just be either a lie, another lie, or, or, or it was the truth. And in this case, it was the truth. How did you react in that moment? In that moment, I looked at her. And I just remember like, wow, mom, that's like really, that's, that's low, that's low. But then her face, her face kind of betrayed something different, <laughs> um, which for my mom, um, apologies don't come <laughs> very often. And so her face looked like something of regret. And it's, it was, it's a, 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 not a, a nuance I wasn't really quite familiar with. And so I looked at her and I was like, okay, that's strange but I still was like uh, I'm gonna go talk to dad so dad can kind of tell me that's not the case and when I walked into the living room and was basically like mom mom said this can you believe this and saw his face I was like uh oh this is oh no this is the truth and I just I ran I ran to, uh, just down the stairs and and there's a pond uh below our townhome and I just was like I don't know where I'm I have nowhere to go I don't I was crying uh I was scared I was overwhelmed I just I don't I didn't know how to process that inf information and I and I guess I needed a documentary to fully <laughs> fully process it just you know 20 years later did you have other people to talk to about it? Did you talk to your friends about it? Did you talk to, I don't know, a priest or a... Or a therapist at the time. Crossing guard. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. No, I mean, I think I talked to my cousin Don uh, and me. Uh, me means bear in Lao. <laughs> it's a nickname for my cousin Utaiwan. Uh, I talked to them about it. But no, I just didn't really have... I didn't have people. And I don't think I felt that I could talk to my American friends about this. Like, it was just too complicated and where would I begin? I didn't start ta I, I didn't go to therapy till I turned 28, so it was a long time before that. Did you feel like at the time you had to, or that you were, in a way, keeping it secret? I think it was because I had heard that my birth father wasn't interested in having a relationship with me because he was afraid that... I would want child support from him, money, and that made me very angry because I didn't want him to, I didn't ask for this, I didn't ask for him to exist, and now this person, like, just straight up rejected me, and 
So I was like, oh, I'm just going to bury this whole thing. I'm just going to try to compartmentalize this and just, you know, disconnect from it. Money is a big part of the film. Must have been a big part of your growing up. Just, I mean, having two parents who are both working multiple jobs because, uh, you know, it's it's hard to be a refugee. Yeah. And then add to the fact that my mom is a gambler. Was she then? Uh, she, she, yeah. Yeah. She definitely. Uh, I grew up, um, you know, first it was playing cards, like Lao games, gay and, you know, them thack and stuff like that. Um, not them thack, what's it called? I don't even remember. Um, you know, they'd be at, at Lao people's house and they just would play forever like almost all night and I'd fall asleep on cold floors. And then I think it just got progressively worse because those would be like house games, but she'd lose, she'd lose, she'd win, but she'd mostly lose. And then when the Mystic Lake Casino opened in Shakopee, Minnesota, that that became a whole other thing. And her game is blackjack. As a parent myself and having lived through some very difficult economic times with my parents when I was a kid, like, you realize that to a child, you know, extraordinarily good economic circumstances for a family are pretty similar to moderately poor economic cir- circumstances if they can be trusted. Like, if you oh, feel like yes, you're yes. being taken care of and yeah. you don't have to worry about whether you are going to be taken care of. Right. 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 You know what I mean? I do. I do. I didn't grow up with that, but yes. <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> I see that as a theory. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, you knew when my mom was up. You knew when my mom was down. Like, it was very apparent. And the thing is, like, my mom, hardest worker I've ever known, worked herself. I mean, she's replaced two knees. She's, you know, she's only, she had me when she was 18. So my parents taught us how to work and I can work and I'm really resourceful. What we weren't great at was like saving money, making money last, uh, not, not overspending, not, you know, because two ways my mom showed me that she loved me was either cooking for me or buying me things. One big way that she would show me she was upset with me, she would take away the things (laughs) that she bought me. Which is torture. Anyways, uh, yeah, so, but my, my mom owned a restaurant within five years of coming to, to this country. She owned a home within five years of coming to this country. She's a ambitious and driven woman with some tough other parts, too. You left town when you turned 18. Yeah, I did. You moved to Los Angeles and went to FITM, the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising. Yes, and I, I, didn't, I didn't do the design part. I did the merchandising part. You must have felt conflicted about leaving when you had two younger siblings. Yeah, but it's also like I just wanted to... After this documentary, I see the parallels of me and my mom is that she left home. Um, she ran away, actually. She ran away because she didn't want the responsibility of taking care of 10 siblings. I had two, 10 siblings. And she wanted to see the rest of the world. She wanted to to see what was out there. And so so did I. I wanted to see, I wanted to have less responsibility. Turns out when you're on your own, you have more responsibility, but... I want a different responsibility, I guess. Or I know. What changed in your life that led you to want to interrogate your past in the way that you do in this film? Because it is a big step to take the actions that you take. Yeah, especially for someone who did truly next to nothing for 20 years since the information was first you know, revealed to me. I did nothing. The but I mean, you you did something, which is you made your you made a new life. Yes, yes, but did no pursuing of right, like learning anything about my biological father. <laughs> I think the the why I found out about his like his first name 
was because I wanted to know what my rising sign was astrologically. And I wasn't even looking for his name. I just needed, my mom was like, I don't know, I was like 7 or 7.30. I was like, okay, I'm going to go to Providence, D.C. hospital, look for my birth, my live birth. And then when it came back to me and I saw birth father's name was Tavi Sak, son of Ongsai, I was like, mom, wh- why does he have your last name? She's like, I don't know. He didn't have a last name. What? What does that even mean? But again, that was so I could know my rising sign. And thank you for asking. It's Gemini. <laughs> <laughs> so I did nothing for forever. Well, my 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 relationship with my mom at the time, right before I decided to do this or to start at least doing the documentary or or to buy a camera, it had just gotten so bad. And her and my dad were, I think, separating. And there's just. Her gambling was really bad, and she, you know, almost got my sister evicted, and and then I had my first miscarriage, and it was the my first miscarriage, my first pregnancy, my first miscarriage that really started to it became sort of a catalyst because I had always been scared and unsure prior to that if I if it would be wise for me to be a parent because of the violence that my childhood was. Um, and I had, because of that, inherited some anger. And I, I, we haven't mentioned this before. My mom was, like, physically abusive. I called the cops on my mom. So I'm worried that I'm going to lose my, uh, that I might beat my child or that I might lay hands on my child. And that is a very real and terrifying fear that I held for years and then I got pregnant and then I realized that I wanted this and I wanted this and I looked at my relationship with my mom which was so so horrible and it became this sort of you know it became about being a mom became about nesting um and if I couldn't do it for myself I would do it for my future child more with Kulap Valaisak in just a bit. Stay with us. It's Bullseye for MaximumFun.org and NPR. Support for this podcast and the following message come from Babbel. Have you always wanted to speak a new language? Whether it's for travel, work, or brain training, Babbel's 10 to 15 minute lessons will get you speaking confidently in your new language. Choose from Spanish, French, and more. You'll learn through real life dialogues, speech recognition, and interactive trainers. And Babbel's spaced repetition method actually makes you remember what you've learned. Download the app or go to Babbel, B-A-B-B-E-L dot com to try Babbel for free. Human behavior doesn't always make a ton of sense, at least on the surface. I said, would you mind if I give the dogs a little piece of cracker with some hot sauce on it and without and see what they choose? Hidden Brain, a spicy podcast about science, psychology, and why people do what they do. Hey, everybody, this is J. Keith Van Stratton, host of Go Fact Yourself, a live game show here in the Maximum Fun Network. On Go Fact Yourself, we take the smartest people we know and make them look dumb. Oh, by the way, how much do you know about chicken husbandry? You got to give them that grain. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Got to give them that grain. And then smart again. What future Hall of Fame pitcher for the Cleveland Indians became the first active player to enlist? Bob Feller. Oh, okay. (laughs) We've got me co-host Helen Hong, plus celebrity guests and actual surprise experts. All right, we have an expert on hand who can tell us for sure. Is Helen. it Alan Havey? Helen, who do we have tonight? Alan Havey! Alan Havey! In the coming weeks, you can hear guests like Maria Bamford, Tom Bergeron, Paul F. Tompkins, Janet Varney, and Grant Imahara. Check us out on the first and third Friday of every month here on the Maximum Fun Network. I'm Jesse Thorne. You're listening to Bullseye. Kulap Valaisak is an actor who has appeared on Children's Hospital, Love, Comedy Bang Bang, and more. She's just released her first ever documentary. It's called Origin Story. In it, Kulap looks at her family's immigration from Laos to the U.S. She also tracks down her birth father, who she didn't know about until she was 14. The documentary is streaming now on Amazon. I want to play a clip from the movie Origin Story, which my guest Kulap Valaisak made about the process of talking to her family about her unusual family circumstances and eventually traveling to Laos to meet her biological father. You know, while I think it would be easy to say that the movie is about you traveling to Laos to meet your biological father for the first time, 
Um, I think that you going to talk to your mother about those circumstances is at least as big an emotional challenge for you in the story of the of the film. Yes. And this is the first time that you go to visit her at home after a long period where she has told you that she will not talk to you about it and and talk to her about her own life and about the circumstances of your birth and, and childhood. I never really felt like you liked me growing up. It was just always so angry with me all the time. I just felt like anything I did wasn't... Well, um, I right? want you to be perfect. I want you to be... I want you to, to be better than me. To have more life going than me. And I do the best I can. I don't know, Mama, you're that. so hard. <laughs> yeah, so yelling so much, so much I yelling. did, I was, I changed after I have Anita and Elsa. I did, when we were with you, I was, I was horrible back then. What was it like to hear your mom say that? Was that something that she had ever acknowledged to you? Hmm. <sighs> I want to say no. I want to say she had never acknowledged that before. I think that's um, the visual of that is me. I'm, as you know, very verbose. And then in those moments, I was just like, shut up and just let her keep talking. Because this is, this is happening. Oh, my God. And there are moments when my sister starts talking, my sister Anita starts talking. You can see me and Alyssa, like, not breathing. (laughs) Because we're like, whoa, like we're talking about this. We're having a conversation. Okay, so if, if we don't want to breathe because we might change the vibe of the room. I mean, it, it it's that scene is kind of, it's such a, it is just our relationship with her mom. Like it's so, it's so visceral and so real. And it goes from, being tense to all of a sudden we're laughing to I'm yelling at my mom within a matter of minutes. It's so hard to hold in your head and hold in your heart the ideas that that one's parents were doing the best they could and particularly, you know, for your parents in truly extraordinarily difficult circumstances and that the ways they messed up messed you up. Like it's hard not to pick one of those stories to tell. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think that was a, when I started to construct the documentary in editing, I think initially I'd hoped that my parents would just be really straight My hope was like, can you just fill in the blanks? Can you just say yes or no? And that's not how it went. And generally doesn't with people, um, especially when you're talking about 33 years in the past, more, right? But what I did get from them, like I, from knowing their stories and knowing their origin stories, I was like, oh, well, I understand them. Now, I don't agree with some of the choices and uh, sometimes my mom did her best. Sometimes she didn't. Quite frankly, sometimes she didn't. Uh, but I also know what resources she had. And I'm coming at her fully American with, like, all the tools that I got from therapy and being around, you know, our peers and how we communicate. Like, that's – she does not have that. So, so now I have compassion because before I was like, why can't mom – Love me the way I need her to. Why am I not enough for her to be the mom that I need? And then to go through this process and and realize, like, mom, what my mom said to me on the phone once was that she does not know how to be in a family. And that is the truest, one of the truest things she's ever said to me. It's like there's a lot of reasons why mom couldn't. And to have that understanding now makes me have peace with with 
with our relationship and where, where we are now. When you traveled to Laos to meet your biological father, it seems like you are very afraid of what he will want from you. Yeah. Were you afraid that of the other things that people are afraid of when they haven't met a parent, like that they're going to be a jerk or something? You know yes, what I mean? Yes, like, yes. <laughs> like that is a that is a distinctive particular element of being a disappointing parent to be focused on. Well, but based on what I was told is that he didn't want me in his life unless because he was worried I would want something from him. Right. And then because my mom's gambling and our very transactional relationship, it just was embedded in it's it's in my wiring. And, you know, when we would go to Laos, my mom would make this like big show of wealth that really wasn't the truth. She worked so hard. Yeah, she owned a restaurant, but she was like working. I mean, those seven days a week. And but when we went to Laos a few times, it was just a really big show of giving people gifts and money and buying things, which I I know there was an element of guilt there of leaving all of her siblings behind, leaving her father behind, running away from home. But it was it really it it was the type of showiness um, that really made me uncomfortable. But that I also saw that like people put value in in that when we were in Laos. Um, so I was worried about that just in, in like kind of in a general like that and had always uh, had this fear that myself was not enough and in any room <laughs> that, that yes, yeah, it was very top of mind. And also pretty early on in a conversation with my father, which is not in the documentary, he did ask me for uh, he asked me if my mom had his their divorce papers. Because it was necessary for him to have them so that he could bring his wife to America. And what I knew was if I found those papers for him, at least I knew for sure that he would meet me in Laos. Your biological father is a very charming, very handsome man. Yes. To the point where when we when they show when you show a picture of him as a young man in the film, I'm like, oh yeah. Just a good looking <laughs> dude right there. <laughs> Dang. <laughs> Truly. Tall. Chiseled. <laughs> yeah. Fit. The guy's got a jawline like you wouldn't believe. I know. And it, it must have been extraordinary to meet him and have any positive interaction with him, which you do have in the film. Yeah. Um, and even though I had my, my doubts, I did have hope. But it must have been very scary when he told you that he and his family were moving to California. Yeah, because like we're I'm all like trying to have control over situations. <laughs> and it's like, wait, no, but I came to meet you and then yeah. I leave and Yeah, that... like Sacramento is too close to your <laughs> world. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that's you all this story is like you all the story of your life is you left town when you were 18 yeah. to make your own thing that took care of you. Or you could take care of you, and your your husband could take care of you as well, I'm sure. But yes, when they decamp to you know a sec, six hour drive away, it's like you don't you don't you don't know on what terms. Yeah, and it's just also just because I'm still like processing meeting him, and I'm processing what my mom said even before I got to Laos. You know, there's just all these things, and now it's like, oh, okay, the hits keep coming. I don't know. I, I mean, at a certain point, you're just like, okay, like when just things are happening, I don't say in crisis, but they just keep coming at you. You're just like, I got to roll with this, but what does it mean? I don't know. I guess I don't have time to think about what it means. I have to, you know, just keep moving. I just have to keep moving. But then when I came home to LA, I think everything just sort of crashed. And I just like, I couldn't emotionally, I just like, well, everything everything that I learned and what does it mean? What does it mean? I think maybe at the time, just more confused about my identity because it just was after doing nothing for so long and then it was just a deep dive in familiar history and not only like meeting my father, but his wife and more sisters. Somebody who's always identified as a older sister. Now there's all these like babies. He has three 
he has three of uh, the youngest daughters of his daughters are with him. And then there was another Amy, um, he with a different wife he had, uh, Amy after me in Sacramento and she lives in Sacramento. So all of a sudden I'm not the older sister of two. I'm the older sister of six. Okay. Like just that alone is like, what? Like, okay. And what does that mean? Who am I to them? And I still am figuring that out. Who? Okay. He's my father. What is that? What does that mean? (laughs) How, how, what do I owe him? Like, it's just so, what does he owe me? Like, and admittedly, I opened this can of worms. It, it, tis me who did this. So what is my responsibility in this? How, how am I going to get this documentary done? Like, I can't, I don't know what's in front of me right now. It was such chaos when I got back. And he asked you for something pretty big. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Spoiler. You were written into a DC comic book <laughs> as a character named Catharsis. That's right. With a K. Yes. But a character named Catharsis whose alter ego was Kulap Falaisak. Yeah. Lao American. Um, and the movie is called Origin Story. You know, years and years ago when you started working on the movie, part of the idea of it was that going through this, these incredible traumas as a child were your superhero origin story. (laughs) I I wonder if now, as a, you know, in your late 30s, you are able to see all these differences that you have from people that you know and... All, all these feelings of outsiderness as the gift that they are in addition to the burden that they are? I think it took for for this for this process for me to 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 feel that way and to and to know that. Um because you know that sound you know, in my early thirties, that sounds like a great idea, Jesse. <laughs> I like that. That's a good idea. But in practice, not so sure. And I and I was joking the other day because I feel like, of course, my friends know that I'm Lao. But like, I think the last five years, like, I feel like people are saying, cool ops really loud because I present. <laughs> That's the first thing. And it's important to me to proclaim that as I enter every room uh, in every grocery store. Um, but yes, I, I think so much about this has been reframing how I look at my past. And instead of it being something that grabs me by the ankles as I'm trying to to, to swim to shore and it's pulling me down and making me drown, it's actually what I've been through. It's strength, it's strengthened me. It's, I am, I am battle born, but I am, I am better for this, even though this <laughs> this was very difficult and hard and heart wrenching and confusing, but I have a sense of clarity and peace that I I did not have before, and a confidence that I did not have. And and I say this in the film: had I not gone to Laos to meet my father, I wouldn't have had the confidence to, like, okay, yeah, let's I'm gonna I'm gonna pitch Bajillion, and then I, I'm yeah, Tomlin and I will be the showrunner. And yeah, you know, I, I'm scared about directing, but I'm going to direct this too. And I joined the WJ and joined the DJ, and that was because I finally took some risks. And I got to tell you, I've been I've been rewarded. Cool up. Thank you so much for sharing all this time and sharing your story with us and um, all the folks who see the film as well. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Kulab Velaisak, everyone. Origin Story is a compelling and moving film. You can stream it now on Amazon. Her completely different, very funny show, Bajillion Dollar Properties, which is a parody of those million-dollar real estate reality shows starring Paul F. Tompkins, 
is also available now. It's also really funny. You can find it downloadable on a handful of platforms. We've come to the end of another episode of Bullseye. Our show is recorded at MaximumFun.org World Headquarters overlooking MacArthur Park in beautiful Los Angeles, California. The lake in MacArthur Park has turned green. We don't know enough about science to know why that is, so we're going to say someone dumped a bunch of food coloring into it. The show is produced by Speaking Into Microphones. If you know why the lake is green, please don't tell us. It's more fun this way. Our producer is Kevin Ferguson. Jesus Ambrosio is our associate producer. We had help from Casey O'Brien. Our production fellow is Jordan Cowling. Our interstitial music is by DJ W, a.k.a. Dan Wally. He sent us some new music recently. Thank you, Dan. You're the best. You rule. You can find a sort of greatest hits of beats that he's made for Bullseye on Bandcamp, and it's uh, pay what you will, so you can go download it for free if you want to feel like you're hosting your own little Bullseye inside your car. Our theme song is called Huddle Formation. It's by the great band The Go Team. Our thanks to them and their label Memphis Industries for letting us use that. And before you go, there are decades of Bullseye available to you to listen to. You can just pick a name of someone that you think should have been on Bullseye and type it into your search engine with the word Bullseye, and I bet it will come up. But also, you can find a Big Archive on YouTube, including all of the interviews you heard on this week's program. Uh, Just search for Bullseye with Jesse Thorne. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, We're on Twitter at Bullseye. And I guess that's about it. Just remember, all great radio hosts have a signature sign-off. Bullseye with Jesse Thorne is a production of MaximumFun.org and is distributed by NPR. 